Okay, we are studying obedience. The whole three months is about obedience. Um, I've never really thought about how much we obey certain things. It's um, something that is so natural to us, um, even when it comes to uh, I think that even siblings many times obey each other because out of respect of a command that may be given to them or whatever, but we as humans obey. Some do it, I have to do it through the middle of their teeth. Others do it um, because they're very submissive. But what we're studying in our lessons this quarter is the obedience to the different commandments and different ways that God has led his people. And what I want us to, to grasp as we study this is not something that we have to do because we have to be obedient to be able to earn uh, the favor of God is to realize that obedience actually makes us better people. Mm -hmm. Because we, when it comes to God and God's commandments, many times um, we hear people, especially that are have backslidden or that are sinners, that God demands so much and he wants this and he wants the other. But little do they realize that all the commandments that God gives us to obey is for our own benefit. It uh, helps us as individuals. There is so much in my life that I have lived. And you all know how old I am, so I won't say. But in all the years that I have lived, and I look back, and I look back at my raising, I look back at my education, I look at uh, the people that I have affected in, in my life. It had, if it had not been for God's mercy in commanding certain things from me, or I'm not going to even use the word demanding. He would command, he would request, he would say it's for your good without even telling me that I needed to do it. All these things, if we take into consideration and we, as we grow older, many of you are a lot younger than I am, but you'll realize that it is these things that has made us the person we are to be able to be what God wants us to be. And I can uh, say that brother Ignacio, sister Rose and sister Grant are more upper, upper, upper in age than some of the rest of you. But if you can learn from us, uh, the scripture still says to learn from the wise. And if you can learn from us that obedience to whatever God requests, demands, asks, or wants of us is not necessarily um, anything bad. It is always for our good. In the end, it's always for our good. And as we have started studying these lessons, in the first one, we saw how God commissioned and called Moses to lead them uh, out of Egypt. Now, our lessons that we are studying is in the Old Testament. Um, some people just read a story. I always try to read it and find something that is beneficial to my soul, beneficial to my life. Um, so that's one of the reasons why many times in Sunday school, and I always remember that Sunday school classes, and we call it Sunday school classes, or we could call it Bible classes, it is so that we can renew the knowledge we have, learn more about it, and be reminded of it. Because some, to some that read the lesson today, or studied their lesson today, it's just a story that they've heard since they were a child. And they're already a sister about a sister Ivy would say they're opening the door to 40. Uh, but they they just see it as something that they already know. But every time we study a lesson like this, we dig deeper and we get jewels that help us in the moment that we need them. So be encouraged, even though it is many of these stories and lessons that we're reading and studying are what we should know, but there's always something there. That is one of the, the scriptures in the New Testament where it says it's unsearchable riches. In other words, there are so many rich things in the scripture that we cannot find them all. 
we're going to go to our grave and we haven't even touched the surface because every time we read a passage in the scripture, we're going to find a nugget if we open our hearts and our minds. So this we find in our lesson today, a promise of obedience. First, we find Moses that led them. He was reluctant. He didn't want to do it. He didn't feel like he was capable, but yet God prepared him. Um, then later on, the Passover lamb was in one of our lessons, and we read about that. That led them directly to a quick escape from Egypt. Um, and that has never been anything like it in the history of the world, as far as that goes. And now in the chapter of history of Israel is about to begin, and we're starting here, the promise of obedience. Um, there's a promise and a covenant that now they're going to receive from God that is very important because it is going to mold them. Let's think about it in a practical day, well, a sense, just those two words uh, before we get into the scripture tonight is when God gives us a promise, do we stand on it? How many of you feel like God has promised you something? Okay, some, some not. Dig a little deeper. <laughs> God has promised, if we are faithful to him, he has promised us certain things. And I'm not just saying what we read in the scripture. I'm not talking about eternal home. I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, being able to live holy. I'm talking about things that personally God has dealt with us and says, don't worry. I'm going to make a way. Don't worry. Things are going to fall in place. And with that comes, from my experience, a peace. You just feel so calm about what you're about to walk into or the decision you're about to make in because God has spoken to you and he doesn't like thunder and lightning. It's just he gives you that assurance or you may have prayed. And when you get up off your knees, you know it was settled. So God is still in the promising business today. It's not just for the Old Testament. And this should encourage us tonight to realize that God has made promises for us and we need to stand on them. This is where many people don't get the promises God gives them is because they don't stand on it and have faith in it. Now, when we're coming to the people of Israel, that he promised them certain things, but they were going to have to do certain things and trust him. Because if they didn't trust him and they tried to do it their way, it wasn't going to work. And we see that in their history. But for us, you and me, to learn that if God promises you something or God reveals something to you and you stand on it in obedience, he will fulfill his end of the bargain. But it's up to us to do our part too. Then he made a covenant with his people. Uh, many times in Spanish, the word is used a pact. And in English, we use a covenant because we have the old covenant, which is the Old Testament laws. And then we have the new covenant he has made uh, to bring us salvation through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So he has made a covenant. In other words, he has come to, to something that is binding. When you make a, a marriage ceremony is a binding covenant between two people just to give you an example so god made a covenant with his people now we're going to start in exodus verse uh chapter 19 verses uh one through two just to start with with sister laura where she's available yeah i'm available in the third month when the children of israel were gone forth out of the land of egypt the, the same day came they into the wilderness of sinai for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. Okay, in those two verses, we began to see the deliverance. In the third month when the children of Israel had gone forth out of Egypt. Okay, um, as slaves in Israel, God, uh, and they had cried out to Jehovah or Yahweh, and he had delivered them. Uh, but before he delivered them, and even while they were crying out, God spent 40 years to prepare a man. 
Who was that man? Moses. 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 Okay. And what is so amazing to me is how the we we all know or should know, and if you don't know, then go back and read. Just jump on board with us tonight. We all should realize that he had been raised as a Egyptian. Uh, his child childhood baby days were as a Hebrew. Then he was turned over to Pharaoh's daughter, and he she he was raised in the court. Yet something happened and he fled Egypt into the land of Median. Now, God used all of these things to form the man. Because God can use a vessel that no matter what their circumstances have been in the past, he can use that for his glory if we allow him. Uh, and he, Moses, being an Egyptian, he knew the language, and I thought this was a, a good reminder for me. He knew the language and he knew the culture. So he knew what to expect when God sent him back to do what he was supposed to do. Now, one of the things that uh, we have to realize here was just how old was Moses by this time? 80. 80. 80 years old. 80. Um, and I, and I, every time I read that, I say, is it the 80 years old that I will be in seven years? Or is it the 80 year old that God just kept him young? <laughs> I've yeah. often wondered that because if, if, if that's the case, then maybe at 80 years old, God can use me some way different. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, but he had been taken from a high plane to a low plane and been humbled down and he became a shepherd from mm -hmm. the courts of Egypt. Yeah. And, and I mentioned to you last week and I want to remind you again that Egypt was in its uh, high place when the Egyptians um, let go of the Israelites. They were in a high, sophisticated, knowledgeable, cultured um, writing, uh, building, everything. That's their culture. And yet he grew up in that. And then all of a sudden he finds himself out in the fields tending sheep. God had a way of working with him. And many times we have to come down from our high places. And you might say, uh, what do you mean by that, Sister Carol? I mean that sometimes each one of us have been born with, and I use this expression, see if you understand what I mean. Each one of us have been born with a different kind of spoon in our mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of you that are Latin just don't get that one, do you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sister, Sister Ivy, would you tell them what I mean by that? The spoon references your... Um... Your status, so silver spoon would be that you are um, of a high high economic status and perhaps a wooden one would mean that somebody carved it for you and that was all they had. It's all they had. So many times we have to uh, get the spoon out of our mouth and come down to where God wants to work with us because um, having a high status, being cultured, um, being learned, is not bad. It's a good thing today in the society we live in because that gives you the freedom to be able to speak to anybody and witness. Whereas if you feel inferior, you're going to be looking like Moses said, he stuttered. So here he was looking for words because he had a deficiency here. So when we, when God molds us and makes us, he makes us to be and to be used like he wants to be used in the place he wants us to be used. And this is where we all have to honor and obey him. Where is it, God, you want to use me? In this case, in Moses's case, God wanted him to be the leader of over a million to two million people and deliver them out of the hand of slavery. 
So God sent, we're reviewing a little bit here, God sent uh, the plagues upon Egypt. Uh, and finally, the Egyptians let the people go. And then, of course, the Egyptians, they decided they wanted them back. They had made a big mistake and they ran after them. And God took care mm -hmm. of that too. So all mm -hmm. along the deliverance, now before we get into Sinai and into the wilderness, all along the deliverance, we see the power of God. That's why when he makes a promise and he shows his hand, why are we going to lose faith? Mm -hmm. So I'll chew on that one a while. And mm -hmm. it was actually three months after they left Egypt that the Israelites came to the wilderness of Sinai. And it was a strange territory for them because now would someone help me here? I could say it, but I've been doing all the talking. Someone tell me what is the difference between the wilderness in Sinai and the land where they were in Egypt? Now I'm talking about the land. I'm not talking about the conditions. I'm talking about the land. Nobody knows except Valerie. So all right, Sister Valerie, I know you know. And yeah, I know what you I know you know what I'm talking about. Turn your mic on, honey. The distance they're talking about is because Egypt was very fertile there and very fertile and very uh, populous with resources. While where they're going into the wilderness is desert and arid and really does not have that fertile uh, richness that they have become accustomed to. What they were encountering is what people like the nomadic tribes were there. Okay. So there was a completely opposite change for them. That's one of the reasons why you hear them complaining that they wanted the garlics and the onions because there was none of that growing in the wilderness. And they had gotten used to the silver spoon. And now mm -hmm. they were going to have to have, as Sister uh, Ivy put it very good, a wooden spoon. Because this is what God wanted to do to mold them into the nation that they could become. Now, as we study these lessons, we're going to find out as we travel along, the reason why they did not become the nation they should have become was because of their own disobedience. Mm -hmm. It was their fault. Woe unto you and to me. If it's our fault, we don't become what God wants us to be. Now swallow that one. Do you really realize that there are great things that God can accomplish with his people if we allow him to do in us what he wants to do? But what happens? We do what they did. We grumble, we complain, we try to do it our way, or we say, no, I'm not going to do that. And sometimes it's going to cost us. It costs them the fertile lands to come now into a dry desert area. Now, in the second verse that we read, for they were departed from uh, Rephendim and were come to the desert of Sinai and pitched in the wilderness and there the Israel camped into the mount. Okay, there we find as they journeyed, they were confronted by the Emeleks. Now, who were the Emeleks? The nomadic tribe over there. Okay, they were, they were people that were actually in the land where they were traveling to. So they had to battle with them. Yes. Um, the, our writer here suggests that very possibly the weapons that they possessed could have been taken from the Egyptians that were slain Probably. or that had lost. Um, and they battled and they thought they were going to win because remember, the Israelites had no weapons. Mm -hmm. But yet here God steps in again and shows his power, his strength. And he gave them the strength and the skill that they needed to conquer them. Once again, we see how God is leading them. Just let God lead you. If we could get that, if you could get excited about that, that God is leading me, it's so much easier for him to demonstrate his power in you, through you, to be used of him. But we're too human. 
and we try to push ourselves into places and do things that we shouldn't be doing. But let God demonstrate his power. I could ask the question. I don't want an answer. Don't even want to see and don't even want to see a hand. When was the last time that you know that God moved in you and demonstrated his power in something that he wanted you to do or some someplace he wanted you to be? That's it's a question for all of us that serve God because I'm looking at a bunch of y'all that's been serving God for a long time. So we're all responsible still, no matter how long we have been serving, serving the Lord, that he would give us the skill and the strength to conquer our enemies, even though we don't have any anything or we think we're handicapped and can't do it. But let him do it. Quit sticking your hand in the pie. Let God do it. It was something, something happened this past week. And I just, honestly, I just, I just felt like. There's just no way. I just can't. I don't have the strength right now. My mind, I, I don't, I can't. I said, I just looked at that person and said, God's going to work it out. I don't know how, but I just let go. And God is working it out. But I had to let go. I had to get to that place that it was not going to be in me. And it was not mm. through my wisdom. It was not through my work. It was just, I just couldn't. But when you get to that point, you know that you can't. God will do the work anyway. Yeah. He doesn't, God, doesn't need, God doesn't need help. Right. And he and the Egyptians and the and the Israelites realized that God did, really didn't need help. We're going to find out later on that they tried their best to help him, and it just did not work. Okay, so now we find him here. Camp was made in Sinai. Now remember that Mount Sinai is by another name also. Someone want to tell me? Horeb. Huh? Horeb. Horeb. Mount Horeb. They're both the same. So when you read them in the scripture, you'll know that Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are the same. Some people get confused. Oh, there's two mountains here. Or they don't put it as the same scenario. So that's part of your history lesson this after, this evening. Okay, so there they camped there. This was in Sinai's southern peninsula. Uh, and it was a great plain where they, they, they pitched their tents. And it was there, more important, it was the place where God chose to speak to Moses. And through him to all of Israel concerning, and I'm going to use this word, the national covenant that he wanted to make with Israel. It was here that this happened. We call it the Mosaic Covenant. We also call it the Mosaic Law. But it was the law for the nation of Israel that he was instituting at this time. Now we come to verse 3, 4, 5, and 6. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Okay. Um God here is talking to Moses and he is reviewing to a certain degree uh, because Moses had been there previously. Sister Marisa, what happened with Moses there previously? The burning bush. The burning bush. So Moses was not disappointed. He was not unhappy when he when God told him, meet me on the mountain. He was ready to go. He was happy. He was happy. He was going to be able to be in the presence of the Father again. And I thought about this today for us personally. Many times, I don't know about you, and I trust that, that this has happened to you, that God wants to talk to you. He wants you alone. He wants you personal. And he's telling you, stop doing what you're doing, and let's spend some time together. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Yes. Yeah, but if you haven't... Yes. You, you need to pray to God that you do because you're la you're lacking something. 
Honestly, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. You are. Because there are times when I, I want everybody gone. And I want to talk to my husband by myself. I'm not referring to you, Brother Adriano. Because when I want to talk to Alice, I'll take him upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm referring to, there are times that you've got to be alone with the person that you care about. You want to converse without children, without anybody. Right, Sister Marisa? The same thing happens if we really want intimacy with God. And sometimes he does, it's time we have a little chat. I use everyday language so that we can get it practical to where we live. And if God has not dealt with you that way in any time recently, you need to pray. I said, Lord, don't you want to talk to me? Don't you want to show me some things? Am I just being mechanical in my prayer, in my Bible reading? Or do I need to just sit down and wait for you to, to start showing me things and talking to me? Because we need that. It makes us, as God's people, feel like we're being loved by him, by being embraced by him that he actually wants us. And there are times in our lives where God tells us to stop what we're doing and go somewhere and pray. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel that. It sure as my name is Carol Figueroa sitting here because it's yeah. happened. To me. Yeah. And he sent me to pray for certain things. And later on, I found out why. But those are that's for people that want to live in the spirit and have an intimate relationship with God. Moses wanted to spend time. He had no problem going up and down that mountain. He was 80 years old, mm -hmm. but he had no problem going up to be with the father. He knew he could not see him face to face, but it was the very presence of God that he needed to feel. Because remember, he didn't feel that while he was down there trying to cancel all their grumbling, trying to listen to them, trying to get them organized. You don't feel what he felt on the mountain. That's why we as Sunday school teachers, as leaders, as parents, we need time alone because so much is overwhelming us. We need that time with God so that we can be able to function. Um, Brother Wilmer and Sister Laura are headed towards having their new baby. They're going to have to learn that number one, they're going to need time for each other by themselves. Number two is they're going to have to learn from each other that I, I need some time alone with God because I can't even cope with two, two babies and hold a job down. I need some time alone to be with God. And he is our strength. Moses, honestly, I believe that Moses had to go to the mountain and God wanted him up there so he could strengthen them to face what he had to face with the people of Israel. You're talking about one to two million people. Mm -hmm. Man, if we think that 50 is hard or we think 100 is hard, can you imagine? Yes, he had helpers. Even they got dis disgruntled with him at times. Do we know our history? We know our Bible history. We know that some of them turned against him. Even his own sister turned against him. But he was filled with the knowledge that God was the one that was leading him. And we need that in our lives. Oh, once again, such Carol turning everything to where we live. But that's what the, we study the Bible for. Is so that it can help us in our daily life. As we think about Moses, we think about what he went through. We think about how he led, how he, he stayed positive in the things of God. And he, 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 he wanted the very presence of him. And... Well, it may be in one of the lessons ahead because I don't go, I don't go ahead. He actually was in the presence of God and came down and had to face all that wickedness that was before him. Yeah. And if he had not had his time with God alone, he would not have been able to face it. That's so true. That's so true. And that's what we need. We cannot face things in life unless we have our time in intimacy with God. So here we have um, the first thing that God told Moses when 
what to do when contacting people was to review what God had done for them to remember. We need to remember where God has taken us from. There's, I, I've always liked the song. It says, remind me, Lord, uh, where, where I was. Be, uh, I forget how it goes. Um, but remind me every once in a while. I like to remember. And I even go so far as to think where I would have been had it not been for God. That's right. And that causes me to appreciate him more and to want him more and want to be in his presence more. Okay, Moses had to remind them of everything that had happened, the drowning of the, the Egyptians, uh, the plagues that had destroyed, the victory over the Amaleks. And what he says, I love it. You have seen what I have done for the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings. Isn't it wonderful just to think, bringing it home, that when we go through our situations, he actually just picks us up like an eagle does his chicks and helps them to soar above our situations. And it is, is, is how he pictured the people of Israel. I brought you through these things. And the same way our God can be that with us. Now, some of us have testimonies of that already. Mm -hmm. Some of you don't because you haven't really faced some brick walls in your life. Mm -hmm. sure. But one day you will. And they're right, Sister Kayla. And they're right, Sister Carla. One day you're going to hit a brick wall. And he will bear you up if you are in the right place for him to pick you up and take you. He won't do it if you've been running around and doing your own little thing. That's just the way it is. Sister Valerie, you raised your hand. Yes. Well, it's just so unique because everyone used that same phrase, how the eagle picks up the chicks. And I don't think people really know that the chicks are not picked up with the claws. The oh, chicks no. are picked up for them to be nested on the wings. So if anything should happen, the mother would take it instead of the children to take it. And that's what brings it back home to where anything should happen. God is what's protecting and he will take it for us and not us. So we will not be in peril. We will not feel the hurt. We will not be damaged through this battle because his wings are protecting and shielding us from all of that, just like the eagle shield her little ones from the predator and from the arrows and from the hunters. And in, in the area that they are in Mount Sinai, they had what they called graphon vultures, uh, not the vultures that we would think of, but it says when, when their floundering chicks were trying to learn how to fly, the parents would swoop under them and bear them up in midair, preventing them from falling to the ground and perishing. And that's the way the Lord was trying to bring the young nation of Israel to that point, to himself to be molded into maturity. Because it was a baby nation. They did not really know how to function. Five Was it 500 years they were in captivity, uh, that they were in Egypt? 400. 400 years they were in Egypt, in captivity. They forgot a lot. I mean, just think about our nation right now. In 50, 60 years, how much has been forgotten and laid aside? So you can imagine in 400 mm -hmm. years... They had forgotten what Jacob had said and what Abraham had said. And here he is trying to mold them. Now there's a reward in that in verses five and six. And it says, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine. What does he mean by the word peculiar? Uh, let me add somebody that looks real intelligent today. Let's see. Hello. Sister Willie May. A peculiar people is um, a people that, um, that is set aside. That is God's people. Okay. And, and they're different than other people. All righty. Uh, anyone else want to add to that? Yeah. Brother in the Spanish, 
in the Spanish translation says, es, es, especial, tesoro especial. Okay. And, and that's what he means there when he's referring to his people, to become a peculiar or a special treasure above all the other people on the earth. This is what Israel, he wanted to become to them because he had already designed that through Israel was going to come the salvation for the world. So he wanted them to be that special treasure. And when you have a treasure, you take care of it. And God wanted to take care of them. They're the ones that later on didn't want God to take care of them. They thought they could do it themselves. Danger, 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 danger. Israel's special relationship had nothing to do with intellect, superiority, ethnic, or culture. It had everything to do with the spiritual submission and development that God wanted for them. Because God gave them the laws, God gave them the covenant, God gave them everything. He is the one that is saying they had nothing humanly to do with it. It's what God wanted to give them. Have you ever thought about what is it God really wants to give me? Ooh, that's a good question. When you think about what he gave, what he wanted to give Israel, think about what does God want to give me? I'm, I'm a treasure. I'm his child. Oh, Lord, help me. Sister Laura has her hand raised. No, it's just a, a, a comment that I wanted to bring up on that verse specifically. Uh, based on what you said, it, verse six, it says, it shall be unto you. No, it shall be unto to me, to me. Uh -huh. a kingdom of priests. I read this verse a lot of times before, but today it just, that part just jumped. Because at the end of the day, only the, the Levites became priests. Right. And to think of, you know, this is kind of like an open plan. Before disobedience, God has a special plan. And through all the disobedience, that plan became narrowed to just one tribe. I mean, Very, that, I good. Saw like Very that, good, brother. Because yeah. we're, we're going to see later on how he had to choose young men to do the sacrifices. Because there was no priesthood. Right. Yeah. So... But Brother Wilmer is very much on the right track when he says it was open, but they narrowed it down. Because I will make unto me a kingdom of priests, a kingdom. That means all of them, right? Right, Brother Wilmer? Yep. Yes. And a holy nation and a holy nation. And then later on, we're going to see that when the sacrifice came, he actually chose young men to do the sacrifice because there was no priesthood. And he chose them from the 12 tribes. All right. Mm -hmm. But then as we go on through the scenario, through Sinai and all the all in there, we find that there was <laughs> obedience, rebellion, there was sneakiness, there's all kinds of things that went on. And then God designed the priesthood through Levi. Okay, uh, now I'm going back here. It's um, verses 20, uh, 20, chapter 24, verses three through, we have jumped around three through eight. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. They, and they said, all that the Lord hath said, will we do and be obedient and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words okay um we won't be able to to go into detail like we did at the first part of the lessons but here we have in this section where there was an acceptance by the people of Israel of the words that Moses brought down from the mountain now, at this period of time, Moses goes up to the mountain, 
again. And he takes with him his brother Aaron uh, and 70 elders of Israel back up to the mountain. But only Moses was able to approach the presence of the Lord. We see that in chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Then he came back down and told the people of Israel what had happened, the ordinances, the commandments, that was designed not to hurt them, but it was designed to govern their lives so they could live at peace and prosper. Um, since we've had uh, Brother uh, Adrian here in the house and uh, him being a doctor, which he's he's not treated me yet, but um, he seems to be a very good doctor, but talking about the different things because he likes to go to the scripture and he will say, well, this and this is good for you because look at what Christ, look what God put in the Bible for the people of Israel, et cetera, et cetera. God did everything in his power to protect the people of Israel, taught them how to eat, taught, taught them what, what to wear, what, where to go. He protected them from the elements with the, the, the clouds. He did everything that was within his capacity as God without saying, hey, 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 you're going to have to obey me. I'm God now. I'm telling you. He did everything to give him the free will to do that. And I think about that for me. God has given me every instrument that he can for me to live holy, righteous, obedient. He has even given me love so that I can love him back. You know, when a person shows you love, what happens to that person to mean you? You love him back. Oh, you love right. him back. You can't help no, yourself. It's just something in us. When a person is kind and sweet and gentle, and I even use the word accommodating, and they are very, we love them. Mm -hmm. okay, let's get it straight. It's not a carnal love. It's just that that's mm -hmm. what we are, okay? We love them. Well, God gives us all these things for us to love him back. He gives us a gentleness that you have never known until you know the love of God. He gives us a kindness that man will not give you. He gives you a protection that no husband can give you. So all these things God was giving to his people to make them a nation, to make them feel. And yet we're going to see how the disobedience to these things ruined them. And help us, God help us as a class. And I look at my class, all of you that are present, there are approximately 29 of you. Each one of you know how you stand before God, but I believe the majority of you believe uh, uh, are Christians. And we have to realize that God is more than just God. He is personal to us. He wanted to be personal to the people of Israel. He wanted, he says, I want to be your God. I want to be there to protect you. That's what he tried to tell them. And yet they're the ones that rejected it. So here we have Moses now, as he comes down from the mountain, the second thing he did when he came down was he rose up early in the morning and he built an altar and set up 12 stone, pillar stones to represent the 12 tribes. Then he would take um, the animals of sacrifice went to the flocks and the, the, the people that he selected, chosen ones to go out to get it. Uh, they selected animals for burnt offerings and peace offerings. And then he uh, consecrated them to the Lord. And yet he took half the blood as a symbol to sprinkle for the people, not just the sacrifice for, for the Lord, but for to sprinkle. Now in Hebrews 9.22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So therefore, we see that through this that God told Moses to do, he is teaching us of what is to come. Mm -hmm. And he's also at the same time teaching the people, I am demanding blood for your sins, for your disobedience. 
and the blood we cannot we cannot worship god unless we have the blood of christ jesus on us mm -hmm. right just a simple fact you cannot truly worship him that's why some people try to worship worship him but their worship doesn't get past the ceiling because they are not wholly covered with the blood would someone this is kindergarten please raise their hand and tell me what i mean by being wholly covered by the blood nobody knows yeah <laughs> yeah Oh, Sister Grant raised her hand. She's the only one old enough. Tell me, Sister Grant. <laughs> to be sure that you have repented, God has forsake, you have forsaken your sins and you're living a holy life. And that's the only way the blood is going to remain on you. Exactly. Just like in the Old Testament. This is where we learn from the Old Testament. The Old Testament was to cover the sins in the blood was there for that. Now, today, it is the blood of Christ Jesus. We cannot have sin and the blood of Christ dwelling in the same place. Right. Work. And sin is what? A willful transgression of the law of Christ or God. That means you willfully tell a lie. You willfully be dishonest. You willfully do things. That's sin. But the yep. blood. And sin cannot dwell in the same vessel. That is why it is so important for us to realize that the blood that was here ordained from the beginning with the Israelites was to cover their sins because there was no Christ at that time. Mm -hmm. So the blood is coming into play now that we must be very serious about it. And I hope you can remember the little example I'm giving you right now that blood. And sin cannot dwell mm -hmm. here. No. The two just won't go together. Sister Floyd. Um, I have a quick question. I'll try. Um, in, in the lesson, it said that they, the first symbolized the people's dedication to God, while the second symbolized a proper spiritual relationship with God. Was that the type and anti-type of the two works of grace? of like salvation and sanctification not necessarily it could be but the the in the new uh, new testament we will see it as a type and antitype but the um what you're speaking about go back and repeat your question that first part of your question again i was just wondering if the part that says the first symbolized the people's dedication to god like when he was doing the burnt offering okay first, dedication you don't you you don't dedicate yourself to christ you had to be forgiven of Christ. So there has to be blood. Right. When he was doing the burnt offerings and right. peace offerings, that's what. So I wasn't okay. sure if that was that. That's all. Yeah. No, the, fir the first one was um, teaching them. Then he sprinkled the people because then that blood, blood was always used to separate, sprinkle to separate. So, yes, you can use it for salvation, and sanctification in that case, in that scenario, if you want to, because the blood, the initial blood is for our sins. And then he sprinkled it on the people to separate them as a holy nation. You understand? Because the blood separated and in the tabernacle, things were separated for the use of God. There was not a sanctification in the Old Testament, except be separated for the use of God. And God, in this point, is separating them. You are now my nation. Well, also, he's blood. doing a new covenant. The new covenant has to have the blood. That's the outpouring to show that they're binding and they are bound to him. And that right. is why, just like when Jesus said, this is my blood. Well, that is why, like you're saying, that's why they have the blood here where he sprinkled it on the 70, probably 70, the leaders there. The leaders the there. The uh, uh, yeah, he, could, he, he didn't have enough blood for a million people. Exactly. Just to the leaders to show them that you're binding to this new covenant, covenant. that you have to now right so th there are various types and in, in things that you can understand from this lesson here for uh you can use it in different ways okay so uh as he did this uh we want to think about and as we close our lesson today that 
the blood of Christ was shed at Calvary for atonement of man's sin because God required it. And he had already shown Israel what was to come. Um, that there's an old song that was written years ago. It says, what can take away my sins? I don't hear nothing it. but the blood of nothing Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If we can realize how important all that is in our spiritual lives, we'll be able to live more victorious. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll also, not only that, but we will keep Christ in first place because it cost him. Yeah. Okay. Choose us to deal with us. And you know what? I often think about this. People hold grudges. Really, uh, a lot of people have grudges. Do you understand what I mean by that? They have things in their heart that they just don't forgive people of. And even though they say they do, it's the first subject they bring up when you're going to talk about that other person. No, or they're in their mind, they bring it up. They really haven't forgiven, but there's just something about God. He does not remember mm -hmm. when you come to him in repentance and mm -hmm. the blood is applied. To me, that is so powerful because man just is not that way but god is i tell you what you ever thought about if god was to stand you up in front of him and he would start naming everything that you ever did and you couldn't find a hole to crawl or call in either it would be awful but just to think that you can stand before his presence one day and he will only be able to read the good and in some people, they have not laid up treasures, as we would say, but he will see the blood and say, okay, come hither, my child. And that's what we're all striving for. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're working for. And that's what we want to be. So that brings us to the end of our class. And we'll have prayer, and then we'll have any questions if you want after I turn off the, the recording. Okay, would you dismiss this? Um, Sister Mel, I thought I saw you. Yeah, you're right above your sister in my screen. Hello, sister. This is Sister Mel. Lord, we come before you once again, dear God, giving you thanks, Lord, for your many blessings, dear God. Thank you, Lord, for our salvation, dear God. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus, dear God. And Lord, we thank you for this class, Lord. We thank you for it each of the saints, dear God, each of the participants, Father, and Lord, we ask that you be with each one of us, dear God, as um, we end the class, Father, that you would help us, Lord, to meditate, dear God, on, on what we've heard, dear God, to, Lord, to um, seek closer relationship with you, if, and Lord, and just to, dear God, just uh, dig deep, deeper into your word, Father, and Lord, to just desire you more, Father God, and to worship you, dear God, as you are worthy, Father, and Lord, we ask that you would just keep us, Lord, um, until next week, Father, and Lord, that you would guide us and direct us in every decision that we have to make, Father, and Lord, that you would um, just help each one, Father, with their uh, prayer requests, dear God, and their needs, Father, Lord, we thank you, and we love you, and we give you glory and honor, dear God, in Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 Amen.